Hello, welcome back everyone. It's a delight to be here with you again live. I, I, again, I'm over a little bit. Is that good, Paul? Over a little bit more? And Paul, I just want to let you know I did move the uh, podium so we might need to address adjust the uh, camera when uh, Gerhard starts speaking. These are all the little details we didn't have to worry about two years ago, right? Um, uh, I, want, I wanted to just quickly take a moment to thank you for being here. I can't tell you how just incredibly enriching it is to be doing this in front of a live audience and for all of you who are out there we know we'll see you uh, soon enough and it's such a great thing the silver lining of course of COVID is that we're able to now reach you uh, in your location so you know we will continue this practice of being able to offer the best of both worlds from here going forward so that's something great that we learned uh, during the COVID period um, I also just want to let you know, folks, that our mission um, for serving the public of North Carolina and making sure that this university, the borders of this university are contiguous with the borders of the state of North Carolina, uh, is to make sure that we can continue to have this incredibly vibrant outreach. Um, we know that you folks uh, pay a not insignificant tuition to come to these programs, and we're very, very thankful for your commitment to that. And I really appreciate that you mark out time in your budget and your day to come and do this with us. It's really quite, uh, in, uh, quite inspiring. We also want you to know that, of course, one of the ways we can reach people who do not have these means and also to make sure that we can reach as many different types of people throughout the state is through our work with our K-12 programs and our community college programs. And none of those programs have tuitions attached to them at all. We do all of that service uh, th through our uh, outreach and through, of course, raising money and development uh, one aspect of our program that unfortunately has been drastically affected uh, is, of course, the revenue for our tickets. We understand we can't be putting on as many programs and we can't charge as much for a, a, a virtual event as we do a live event. So uh, about 18 to 20 percent of our revenue for our entire organization that we use then to go and support our K-12 teacher programs and our community college programs, <laughs> about 18 to 20 percent comes from our ticket sales, and we have had just a well a devastating hit on that revenue in the past year and a half. I um, I'm I'm here asking you folks to consider giving to Carolina Public Humanities not today if you don't want to, but to take this with you inside your packets uh, or to go online. If you are online, we have uh, Paul be giving some information uh, to help us continue this mission. Um, we are not in a critical state, but it has been a big hit for us, and we appreciate uh, if you would consider helping us out so when we get back up and running, we can have as many programs and generate as much revenue and be in the same position we were in. Um, thank you for considering. We have different options of to donating to our general fund, donating to K-12 education, donating to the Lloyd Kramer Faculty Fund, just recently established in honor of our director, Lloyd Kramer, uh, and, and other options for you available online for giving. All, tax, all donations of any size are completely, completely appreciated, and of course, all are tax deductible. So I wanna thank you to, for considering giving to Carolina Public Humanities um, so that we can get up and running and be having this vibrant program that's been running for over 40 years for the next 40 years as well. So thank you, and one more time, we wanna welcome Dr. Gerhard Weinberg. When Germany attacked the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, I should mention again that it had allies uh, to repay the Germans for rescuing Italy's disastrous campaign in Greece earlier that year. Uh, Italy immediately declared war also on the Soviet Union and, as is often forgotten, substantial numbers of Italian forces were employed on the Eastern Front. And this may not be the right place to include it, but I think it's important enough and ignored generally in the literature. The heavy casualties that Italian forces suffered in their participation in the fighting on the Eastern Front. And we can't go into the details, but they suffered very heavy casualties. Had a tremendous effect inside Italy. One cannot understand 
the total collapse of the fascist government in Italy in 1943 and its surrender unconditionally to the Allies. Unless you keep in mind that for the people, the civilians, the population of Italy, the, this, what was the point of all of this? Why on earth should Italian forces be fighting in the Caucasus? Why should they be fighting on the Eastern Front against Russia, which had helped the Italians when they were subjected to restrictions in trade after invading Ethiopia in 1935. The Russians had helped them. The Russians had helped them in the First World War. What on earth? You could, if you were in Italy, argue that there are places in the Mediterranean, like Malta, and in North Africa to expand the Italian colonial empire. Hmm? But why on earth should Italian forces fight on the Eastern Front against the Soviets who've done nothing to us and from whom we're not going to get anything if we beat them. In other words, uh, I, I mention this at this point in time, even though it doesn't fit that well, uh, is because the internal collapse of the fascist movement in Italy cannot be understood unless one keeps in mind this participation with large numbers of casualties in fighting which nobody in Italy thought made the slightest, weeniest bit of sense. Romania and Finland also joined Germany and that was because they hoped to regain what they had lost just recently in territory to the Soviet Union and maybe, hopefully, in both cases, get some additional territory. Okay. The people in Romania and in Finland could understand that, whether they liked it or didn't like it, it from they made some sense for their government to do this. Just the opposite of the people in Italy who couldn't imagine, for very good reasons, what on earth was there for the Italians fighting around in these faraway places in Russia. Hungary also joined in, and this was because they wanted, the government of Hungary wanted further territorial concessions in Southeast Europe from Germany and assumed that this was the only way to get them. As I have already mentioned, the Germans were planning to kill vast masses of prisoners of war, all Jews, gypsies, and some others. And those things start on the first day of the campaign. At the beginning, as I mentioned, the Germans advance rapidly, and uh, Holder and Hitler think that the Soviet Union would collapse and Germany would win very quickly. But this was the result, I would suggest, of total intelligence failure on the one hand and assumptions about 
the Soviet Union on the other. These were inferior people who were being directed and controlled by hopeless incompetence. And I mentioned the incident about the tanks as the Germans discovered the Russians had tanks which were bigger and better and stronger than anything the German army had. What I think is also important is that while there were problems in Soviet industry, the Germans never had a reasonably accurate understanding of either the size or the productivity of Soviet industry. And as I mentioned, the behavior of the Germans very quickly rallied the re people to the regime in a way that was quite different from what had happened in the First World War. Included among those who now rallied to the regime would have been people in the category that we tend to forget. In the First World War, the Germans had captured hundreds of thousands, several million Russian prisoners of war. Somewhere upwards of 90% of them eventually came home. Any of them who lived in the area that the German army overran in 1941 could see for themselves that this was a different army that behaved in a different way from what they had experienced. Word of what the Germans were doing and how this was a totally different army from the one that had occupied substantial portions of Imperial Russia, passed around through the local countryside and through the whole Soviet Union relatively quickly. The regime, in other words, could count on a level of commitment and loyalty on the part of its people that was fundamentally different from World War I. Try to think of this for a moment, of some family somewhere in the middle of this big country. Our sons are fighting in a war that starts over the killing of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne in a faraway place that we've never heard of and can't spell. What on earth difference does it make to the people of Russia. That there would be eventually a collapse of support for the war effort in World War I Russia has to be compared, I would argue, with the situation in the Soviet Union where People were still very unhappy about the purges in the government, non military, the purges Stalin had carried out, the collectivization of agriculture, and all kinds of other things. This was not a country where 
people were all enthused about the communist regime. But what, if you will, drove them all into Stalin's arms as devoted helpers was what they were learning and what word was being passed around the country about the invaders. This was, for the vast mass of the population, including obviously the workers in industry and the re people recruited into the army, a fundamentally different situation from the First World War. Now, the Germans in June 41 broke through and advanced. On the Central Front, the largest German army group headed for Moscow. It was, however, slowed and what I would argue was most important, the Red Army didn't collapse. Yes, there were large numbers of surrenders of troops. There were all kinds of technical and tactical problems. But the Red Army continued to fight. And I have mentioned that on the Yelnya and Smolensk front, there was in fact a Soviet counteroffensive at the end of August, which the Germans managed to stop and then resume their offensive. But that really sh should have explained to them that things were not the way that Germans had expected. At the southern end of the front, the Germans headed for Rostov-on-Don, cut off the Crimea, invaded it, but did not occupy all of it. On the central part of the front, they headed for Moscow. And at the northern part, another army group went through eastern Poland and the Baltic states and headed for Leningrad, which was to be assaulted from the north by Finland's, uh, from the German perspective, allied army. Now, what happens is that two things are critical, I would argue. One is the Red Army doesn't collapse. It suffers local defeats. And those are not the same thing as the collapse of a system. And as I mentioned, that as a result of the neutrality pact, with Japan, and Japan's move against the United States, Britain, and the Netherlands, the Russians can move forces from the Far East that were there to halt a Japanese offensive. These are increasingly moved to the front against Germany in the winter of 1941-42. What happens as a result is the Germans are halted before Moscow and in the winter things go very badly for them. Since they were going to win their war in a couple of months. They don't have preparations for the winter. It really 
might not have come so much as a surprise as it did. This may be unreasonable of them, but Russia has a winter every year. <laughs> and although you would never recognize this from reading the memoirs of German generals, it got to, about, to be about equally cold for the Soviet army as for the German. And Stalin did not control the snow. It had a tendency to fall wherever it wanted to. It was not that it fell only on the Germans, as uh, the memoirs of most German generals would lead you to think. Just as before the big snow in the Rasputitsa, that is to say the wet season, curiously enough, it rained on the Red Army too. What you had, in other words, was two major forces fighting each other, but under identical territorial weather and other conditions. These were not separately and specially arranged by Stalin. But it rained and snowed, it got cold for everybody. It's just that the Germans had assumed, number one, the war in the East would be over before it rained or snowed. And number two, they had never made the necessary preparations if the war in the East continued into the first into the rainy season and then into the snowy season. And in this regard, it's easier perhaps to understand how an army that suffered tactical setbacks but continued fighting could impose on the Germans a level of casualties and material losses that they simply were not able to replace, in part because they couldn't change the tracks on the trains fast enough. And there was a further aspect that, had, that might have occurred to them but didn't. The snow and rain wasn't good for the horses. And curiously enough, it did not hurt or affect the German horses any more than it affected the Russian horses. But the Russians had prepared. They knew this was to happen. And one has to keep that in mind. In addition to the first slowing down and then driving back of the Germans on the central part of the front before Moscow, their campaign towards Leningrad in the north also failed. Tikvin, which is north uh, east of Leningrad, was the first place there retaken by the Red Army. The Germans simply could not get as far and meet the Finns as they had hoped. We tend to forget that the same thing was true at the southern part. Rostov on the Sea of Azov there in the south was retaken by the Red Army, as uh, Tikvin was in the north. In other words, it, it was not just what is usually and quite intelligently taken as very important, that the Germans were stalled and pushed back before Moscow. 
their campaign at the northern end and southern end of the front was also halted and pushed back a little. Thereafter, that is to say in January and February of 1942, Stalin made one of the major errors of the war. Instead of concentrating forces on the German Army Group Center that had been bull really banged up in the fighting for Moscow, he thought that now that the Germans have been halted essentially everywhere, we should push them back everywhere instead of concentrating on a major blow to try to destroy that German army group that had been most affected by the Soviet resistance <laughs> before Moscow and the counteroffensive, he ordered attacks everywhere. And while these made some uh, minimal advances, uh, they uh, did not destroy German army groups. Now, the Germans now had to decide what to do next, what to do in 1942. The first thing that they were going to have to do was to occupy the Crimea. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yeah. Which they had, so to speak, cut off and bypassed in their advance at the southern part of the front in 41. And if you ask why f was the Crimea important, that important militarily, it was that from the Crimea, Soviet planes could fly and bomb the Romanian oil fields. It was the other side of the issue of the Germans rescuing the Italians in Greece, not because they felt that kindly towards the Italians who had attacked Greece in October uh, of 40, but it was the same issue that the British help for the uh, Greeks would put British troops and airplanes into Greece from which they could bomb the Romanian oil fields, which were essential for the German war effort. So just as then Germany had helped the Italians to make sure that there were no British planes flying from Greece to bomb Romanian oil fields, so in 1942, the first thing the Germans were going to do and did do was conquer the Crimea to keep Russian planes from bombing the Romanian oil fields. The other thing thereafter was to advance east towards Stalingrad and on the way also head further south into the Caucasus. There is, a, if you will, an important distinction between two targets in that direction. One is Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. The Germans did get to it. One of their units did climb it. 
and they were able to hoist the German flag on the top of Mount Elbrus. Symbolically, you could argue that that was of some importance. But the real major target in that direction were the oil fields. They did get the ones around Mycop in the north, but they got stalled as they moved further. The reality, if you will, was that while the German army, assisted in this area by the Italians and Romanians, could make some progress at first, they got the microbe oil fields, but could not go to get further to Grozny and Baku. It was simply they didn't have the push anymore. They did manage to get to Stalingrad. But this was, I think it is fair to say, a grinding battle. And there was the further factor very important, but usually not discussed in the literature. If you concentrate on one segment of the front and push successfully forward, the more successful you are, the longer your flanks become, by definition. right? And since the Germans did not have the extra units to utilize to protect these ever longer flanks, they had to depend increasingly on their Romanian, Hungarian, and Italian allies to provide the forces for these increasingly lengthened flanks. The more successful your drive, <laughs> the bigger, by definition, the problem, because the longer in mileage or kilometers your flanks became. And this was where, in November of 42, the Russians then struck. They could see this. And, as you probably know, cut off, met by attacking the flanks, cut off the German army that had reached Stalingrad and was fighting in the city from block to block and house to house. Thereafter, Yes, the Germans launched some counteroffensives which didn't go anywhere and tried their best to supply the army cut off in Stalingrad from the air. And here they were misled by an earlier experience in the winter of 41-42. A, a German, small German force had been cut off in the northern part of the front, and they had been able to supply it from the air until they could break through to it. But nothing like this was possible with the huge German army in Stalingrad. They could fight and did fight surrounded and by December. They fight there all through January into February, but their supplies are giving out. Their soldiers are, in many instances, simply dying from exhaustion. They can't get anywhere. Before I turn to the Caucasus part of the German operation, I do want to call to your attention an aspect of this 
that has important implications, in my opinion, which none of you is required to share, on American strategy in 1944 in France. It has always been my opinion that the reason that Eisenhower insisted on a broad front operation and not as a strike at a particular point was that he did not want to repeat in the West the experience the Germans had had in the East. That is to say, the more successful your single strike is, the longer its flanks become. Hmm? And when you're fighting a well-organized and equipped enemy, what that means is the risk of the flanks being cut and your great successful advance being trapped. You will find in the literature, especially the British literature, much criticism of Eisenhower for his decision for the broad front rather than the single thrust. And in the memoirs of some of the American and British generals, you'll find that too. All I can tell you, and as I said, nobody has to share this opinion. I have long always been convinced that Eisenhower was convinced by the German experience at Stalingrad that a single thrust from a portion of a long front is not very wise if you're fighting an army that knows and is controlled by people who know what they're doing because then you get your advance cut off. In any case, rightly or wrongly, the Germans kept the fight there but in the end, then Stalingrad had to surrender. The drive into the Caucasus got into the mountains, and that meant it did take the Mykop oil fields. But they were stalled. They simply could not push the Russians back far enough to take the big oil fields there at Grozny and Baku. And after the uh, encirclement of the for German forces in Stalingrad, the Soviets hoped to drive to Rostov and cut off the German army force in the Caucasus. But they were not successful in doing this, so they, in effect, pushed them back. But that was the way it went in 1942. As the Germans and the Russians looked to 1943, the Soviets figured we'll try to finish off this force down there in the south, and get back into the Crimea, and push on from there. Uh, let's see. At the end of this uh, southern operation, the Soviets decided to make attacks on the Germans in various places. But the Germans decided that, from their point of view, losing at Stalingrad and losing in the Caucasus was bad enough. 
but they had to have the whole Ukraine and keep it, and therefore decided that their summer offensive in 43 would be on the salient in Kursk that the Red Army had managed to develop in the winter. So you have a bitter, lengthy campaign in the summer of 1943 in which German, by now very minimal German allied forces, were going to advance and retake even more of the Ukraine, but the Red Army fights them. And in terms of what's going on in the war as a whole, the failure of the German operation Citadel, as its code name, uh, they do not destroy the Korsk salient. One of the contributing factors in this is the shift in Stalin's attitude towards his military commanders. Just as the reverse of Hitler trusting his generals less and less, Stalin trusts them more and more. In 1941, he had been of the opinion that the Germans would drive most for the Ukraine because that's what they want the most. And he had the strongest forces there. And that meant that the German initial advance was slower in the south than in the north or center. One of those things. He made another mistake then in 42. He thought that the Germans would resume the major offensive towards Moscow, when in fact the German major plan was in the south. Okay. But by now, by 43, Stalin is beginning to pay attention and occasionally follow the advice of the top Red Army commanders. And when they insist that this time the Germans are going to try to destroy our Kursk salient, and we better set up various lines of defense and commit our forces against this, Stalin goes along with it. And this is a successful situation. The German advance is crushed in a series of battles which include what are generally considered the largest battles of armored warfare of both sides against each other in the Second World War. And now, the Germans, having failed in their offensive in 1941, in 1942, and in 1943, you will perhaps understand that overall perspectives of both sides are changing. The Germans are not about to get to Vladivostok, and they know it. What they've got to do is defend themselves, maybe return to the offensive sometime. But their main concern now is, what will the Russians do? The other reversal takes place on the Soviet side. It's now our turn for a major offensive in 44. And they are more hopeful in this regard for a, with a contributory element. By this time, 
American and British forces have landed in Sicily and Italy, and the Allies are committed, the Western Allies are committed to what comes to be known as Operation Overlord, uh, the landing in Normandy. The Russians, uh, uh, Soviet leadership has in a way coordinated this uh, with the uh, Western Allies and their plan is to destroy the German Army Group Center. And interestingly enough, there's not only the deliberately coordinated, to some extent, timing issue. The Allies will land in Normandy first, that they were going to do it in May, but then in June. And the Soviets are going to launch their big operation also in June. We call ours Overlord, as I'm sure you know. They call theirs Bagration, which was the name of a battle in which they had defeated Napoleon when Russia was invaded before. It seemed kind of nice to use that uh, name. And what was not planned, but I find very interesting, is that both the Westerners and the Soviet Union decide that for such a major operation, we have to fool the Germans so that they'll have their troops in, to a considerable extent in the wrong place. As you probably know, in the planning for Normandy, there is fortitude. The cover operation in which the Germans are to be persuaded the main landing will be in the Calais area and uh, the Germans put the 15th Army into the Calais area uh, to uh, halt this Allied invasion which of course never comes because as I'm sure you know uh, we land in Normandy instead. The Russians do something very similar. They do tricks much like those that the Western powers used to persuade the Germans that we were, that the Russians were headed to destroy the German army group North Ukraine, when in reality they were going to destroy army group center. And in June, not long after the Western Allies land in Normandy, not the Calais area, the Russians strike at Army Group Center and not North Ukraine and surround, break through their front north and south of the army group and destroy. It is Germany's largest uh, battle defeat of the Second World War. The army group is destroyed and the Russians now can advance. Now, uh, let's see. There's something wrong here. I've not the right maps not coming up. Huh? I want the front and the latter part of the war. There's a 43-44 map. There. I think that will do it. The success of the destruction of the German army group in the center 
has implications that are very important for the Eastern Front as a whole. It makes it possible for the Soviets to effect to advance both north and south because after this whole army group, over half a million is destroyed, the Germans have to move forces from the northern and southern end of the Eastern Front to repair the middle. And so that means that at both ends, they, the Red Army can keep pushing forward and to entertain the Soviet publication, they take some 20,000 of the German soldiers captured in Operation Bagration on the Central Front and march them through downtown Moscow. You may have seen pictures of this uh, big parade. Uh, this was a way of showing the Russian people by newsreels and newspaper pictures and so on. This is the only way the Germans can get to Moscow. If they're prisoners, we will march them and they get to see a little bit of the city while they're marching through it. Uh, uh, more uh, important in the long run for the Soviets is, of course, they are pushing back the Germans at both ends of the front and into the Balkans. And under those circumstances, uh, what is particularly important from the, everybody's point of view is that the Red Army pushes into Romania. And that means that Germany's major supply of natural oil, as opposed to synthetic oil, is seized by the Soviet side of the front. They also uh, occupy Bulgaria, and they are fighting in Hungary. There, the Germans make their last counteroffensive because there is a section of Hungary uh, where there are oil wells. But uh, these efforts of the Germans are crushed uh, relatively quickly by the Red Army. Under the circumstances, as the geography will show you on the map, the Red Army moves across Poland after Operation Bogotzion. The Germans counterattack, and there is fighting in and around Warsaw, in and around the Baltic states. But at no place is the German army able really to halt, as opposed to delay, the Soviet advance. So that by October of 44, as the Western Allies are breaking out of their foothold in Normandy and pushing the Germans out of France and Belgium, the Red Army is moving into the easternmost portions of Germany, East Prussia and Silesia. Hitler had established a fortress concept under which German forces isolated by Red Army advances would simply stay in place and fight and fight until they were all killed, not because the places themselves were of such great importance, 
but this was the only way to halt the Red Army, wear it down, and keep it from advancing more rapidly into the interior of German-held forces. And the main city of Königsberg in East Prussia, now Kaliningrad uh, in the Russian Federation, uh, is one rather dramatic example where literally for months German forces are holding. Breslau, the big city in Silesia, now Wachlow in Poland, is another example of this uh, fortress concept on a very large scale. But in the end, this merely means more military and civilian casualties with the Red Army continuing to advance and fighting in Berlin until Hitler and his recently married wife commit suicide and his designated successor, uh, Admiral Dönitz, uh, agrees to the unconditional surrender uh, of Germany to the Allies. By this time, the Soviet Union has suffered 27 million casualties, military and civilian. And of Germany's 5,300,000 dead soldiers, 4,300,000 were killed on the Eastern Front. And please note that that figure alone is more than twice the number of German soldiers killed in the whole First World War. It's worth remembering. The Soviet effort has been the main effort of the Allies to defeat Germany. The British and Americans have certainly fought and done their share, but it is important to remember, and I don't usually think uh, uh, announcing statistics is worthwhile, but these are at least useful. The Allies had sent the Soviet Union 12,000 tanks, 22,000 airplanes, and 375,000 trucks. The Red Army therefore had, as it lost vast quantities of equipment, substantial supplies from the Allies. Stalin always complained that there wasn't more. And as you will understand, the Allies were much too polite to tell him that the ships he'd helped the Germans sink could not carry supplies to the Soviet Union. <laughs> They, they would do what they could and lost many ships and men in the effort to supply the Soviet Union. But along with the enormous productivity of the Soviet industrial system, including that which had been moved to escape the German occupation, the Allies, Western Allies did provide very substantial help and certainly uh, the trucks greatly helped uh, the Soviets move supplies to support their advancing soldiers uh, into parts of Europe that, if you will, almost by definition, were being devastated by the fighting 
and where the Soviets were not able to use the railways, even if they captured them, because their own railway equipment was designed for a different <laughs> railway gauge, uh, a subject we've talked about before, but now has a different impact because it's the Russians who are advancing and the local uh, train, uh, can't, they can't run their regular trains uh, on the local tracks. The efforts made by the Soviets in the war uh, imposed, as I indicated, the overwhelming majority of casualties that Germany suffered. But the country, that is the Soviet Union, in physical destruction and human losses, certainly bore the scars of a very, very hard fight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard, for that wonderful uh, lecture. Now it's your on turn. What's that? Very nice lecture on grim subjects. Do we have questions from the audience in the room? Yes, we'll start here. Joel. Uh, quick question. Um, the, the Soviet Union had a very dictatorial government type, and Stalin was, an, was absolutely convinced not to surrender. Do you think the level of casualties and destruction visited on the USSR could have been survived by a democratic type of Russia? Could, could the Soviet Union have survived if it had a more democratic government, or was the dictatorial... I'm sorry, it's over again. Yeah, I can't over make you. out what you're could, saying. Could the, the Soviet Union, we know Stalin was a dictator, yes. and he held on grimly. Yes. Could, would the Soviet Union have been able to hold on so uh, firmly and, and not, not surrender if it had been a democratic government or was it necessary for it to be a totalitarian dictatorship in order to have that sort of control? That uh, it doesn't seem to me that it was in any way necessary to have a dictatorship given the procedures that the Germans followed in World War II as compared to World War I they provided the population with an incentive that they did not have in World War I. I think one has to see this in terms of how the vast majority of people in the country see a challenge. Let me make a suggestion which I hope will not offend anyone. Americans were not really that enthused about fighting Germans and Japanese. But remember Pearl Harbor was something that Americans reacted to. Those so-and-sos attacked us on a Sunday. We're going to give it to them. And if the Germans want a war with us, well, okay, we'll oblige them. Uh, one has to see, in other words, what I would consider a difference in the public. And whatever kind of government the Soviet Union had at the time, really, in my judgment, this is a matter of opinion, and uh, didn't make that much difference. You have this kind of an invader coming in, slaughtering everybody. Whether you have one kind of government or another, <laughs> you're going to fight them. And uh, uh, the difference, in other words, was not that the Romanov leadership was in some measure particularly incompetent. Uh, and therefore, the central powers could defeat the Russians and drive them out of the war. Uh, the important point here was for the ordinary person living in some Russian city, what is this all about? Quite different 
from the situation which the Germans created in World War II. The conversion, as I mentioned, of Stalin from a feared and to some extent even hated dictator to the savior of his people was something only the Germans through their policies and procedures could pull off. Thank you for that, Gerhard. Have a question here? Could you comment on the tank battle at Kursk? Could you comment on the tank battle at Kursk? Make some comments on it. Just a little bit more information on the tank battle at Kursk. Well, what you had there was the largest engagement of tanks on both sides and heavy losses on both sides. But the Germans had more difficulty replacing the tanks they lost than the Russians. <clears throat> and an argument can be made that by this time, we're talking of summer of 43, Allied bombing of German factories was not reducing German tank production, but keeping the Germans from increasing it even more than they already were doing. And furthermore, you must keep in mind that the German tanks are in most cases very a very recent production. And one of the things which is striking, it, to me at least, is the number of German tanks sent into the fighting in the Operation Citadel who break down on the way and have other problems. These are new constructions. And a proportion of them quite literally breaks down, not because of what the Russians do, but because there are problems in the manufacturing process. So uh, one has to see this, I think, as a very significant part uh, of the fighting on the Eastern Front. And there, except for a tiny operation in Hungary, the Germans never thereafter are able to mount a significant offensive operation. We have a question here with Hoyt. And I remind our folks uh, online that we do have an opportunity to ask questions online, but let's get a question from Hoyt. Uh, it seems like I've heard that Eisenhower held back in the West to allow Stalin to come in on the east in f into a Berlin, to take Berlin. Anything to that? Certainly, there were several factors in Eisenhower's decision not to make a major effort to take Berlin. The Russians were obviously already getting closer and there was still always, in my opinion at least, the concern of what would happen to a single thrust with open flanks. Keep in mind that the Russians were not doing anything like that. Their front was moving towards Berlin, and in fact, Stalin, if you will call it that, decided to have two of his field marshals make a race for it, one with an army group north, center and north of Berlin and another army group to the south, so that under those circumstances, there wasn't a thing the Germans could do. From Eisenhower's perspective, and the American and British leadership in general, what at this point was really important was a totally different political objective. And that was to get to the Baltic Sea so that the Red Army would not occupy Denmark. And an American army, this is another thing that Eisenhower does, is turned over to Montgomery's British Army Group so that they can advance to Rostock and Misbar on the southern shore of the Baltic Sea and make sure 
that the Red Army does not occupy Denmark. Uh, everyone is entitled to their opinion of these choices, but uh, uh, the Stalingrad memory and the concern about the advance of the Red Army along the southern shore of the Baltic uh, seem to make it to our supreme commander, Dwight Eisenhower, to make sense to let the Russians make the big wide push and suffer the enormous casualties involved in that. And we'll strike to the Baltic Sea and get the northern portion of Germany, Schleswig-Holstein, and Denmark. Great. Thank you for that, Gerhard. We have a question from our online audience. Jim Leggett asks, earlier you had mentioned that Germany underestimated the Soviet Union's economic strength. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the Soviet Union's economic strength? I, I, I'm sorry, I so could, the, could the, not hear it all. The question was, uh, Earlier, you mentioned that Germany underestimated the economic strength of the Soviet Union. Yes. And the question was, but from Jim Leggett, was to just elaborate a little bit more on that. Sure. From the German perspective, having defeated Russia in the First World War, as they had, knew they had, the industrialization of the Soviet Union in the 1930s was to make that country get out of the 18th century. And it was led and administered by a collection of hopeless incompetents who had displaced an at least partially competent bureaucracy, both in industry and in administration. The idea, therefore, that these inferior, racially inferior people could produce tanks at a rate roughly two and a half times that of Germany, and airplanes, and all kinds of other weapons simply did not fit in with their view of these people who were dependent on outsiders and the German element in the society to help them move forward. And while their air reconnaissance, to which I referred, which starts in October of 1940, showed some of the factories as well as uh, airports and other things, uh, it gave no real sense of the industrial capacity of the Soviet Union, nor did they ever understand the extent to which, however much depreciated by Stalin, the Western allies could and would provide assistance in the material sense. I gave you statistics on weapons, but there were, in addition, vast quantities of other supplies of things from the Western Allies to the Soviet Union. And while the Germans did what they could to interfere with that and sank lots of Allied ships and killed lots of Allied sailors and soldiers in the process, the reality was that a functioning industrial system was aided by massive imports from other industries in other countries. Great. Thank you for that answer, and thank you, Gerhard Weinberg. Please put your hands together for Gerhard Weinberg. I want to thank all of you who came today. This has been so inspiring to see you live, although I can only see half of your faces. It's been very, very inspiring. 
And thank you all online for joining us today. I want to remind you folks about our Humanities in Action series at Flyleaf Books on Wednesdays, and of course, Lunch with Friends and Strangers next Friday. Go to our website, check out humanities.unc.edu, and we have a whole host of programs. We hope to see you at one soon. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Enjoy this beautiful fall day. Take care. Thank you.